What's up, good people? Thank you for joining the conversation. We continue our talk on ancient Egypt. Mm, mm, mm. I was uh, listening to a lecture earlier and Man, I'm I'm not quite sure how to explain it, but it was very interesting. It talked about two brother kings that avenged their father. It talked about the Hyksos, who some people, from what I've heard, believe that the Hyksos were the, the early version of the the uh, uh, nation, the black people, black nation, otherwise known as uh, Israelites. So, he gets into all that. But he also says some pretty pretty in-depth things towards the beginning of the lecture. Yeah, I did say the beginning of the lecture. So, this one's going to be a little long, y'all. You might want to pause, get you something to snack on, get you a little drink. Take notes if you want. And with that being said, let's get into it. Last. The second intermediate period, what we're going to talk about today, is the second time that Egypt collapses almost totally. Uh, I said it once before. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's true that Egypt is the only civilization in the world that ever collapsed completely twice and got its act back together again. And what we'll do today is we'll look at this second collapse. Now, it's different from the first intermediate period in that the first intermediate period, we're not really sure what happened. Why did it go downhill? Remember we talked maybe Pepe II got too old and couldn't rule the country. Maybe it was they stopped building pyramids or something. And we don't really know for sure. But this we start to get an idea, a pretty good idea. What you're going to see today is three distinct phases. I'm going to try to cover three phases. We're going to see the next dynasty, Dynasty 13, which is going to go downhill. You're going to see Egypt weakening. And then we're going to see another period where Egypt is ruled by foreigners. And that's the reason it really goes downhill. Egypt, in a sense, is perhaps conquered. And then the last, the good part, the part I like to tell about, is when Egypt kicks out the foreigners and Egypt is on top again. So we'll see three distinct periods. Egypt on the downhill, Egypt really conquered, and then Egypt on top again. So hang on and you'll see Egypt up up there again. Uh, Let me say something about Dynasty 13. In a sense, it's a lost dynasty. We have the names of ten kings or so, but we don't know much about them. Um... They built some pyramids, which is a sign that everything isn't falling apart. Uh, there are some pyramids at Dashur, for example. Now, again, remember, you know, you've heard that name Dashur quite often. They're going back to the good old days. They're going back to the time of Sneferu, who built his pyramids at Dashur. Um, they're saying we somehow are still associated with py- this period of greatness. You know, I often wonder, though, what do they feel? See, the pyramids that they built are small mud brick affairs. There, you know, where, where, where Sneferos is a few hundred feet high, you're talking about 150 feet high made of mud brick. When you're in the shadow of Sneferos' pyramid, and when these guys are building their pyramids at Dashur, they can see Sneferos. You can see Sneferos' pyramids from miles away. Miles away. They're building these little pyramids. Did they feel sort of an inferiority complex of, gee, we couldn't quite do anything like this? Mm-hmm. One of the guys who built at Dashur did, in fact, say, not since the time of Sneferu has its like been done. Uh, well, it wasn't really like Sneferu. Uh, but they did build at Dashur. Uh, I, I have a hunch, though, that one of the reasons they built at Dashur was for religious-magical purposes. In the Old Kingdom, immortality wasn't quite yet for everybody. The general feeling I get from reading texts and, and just looking at monuments is that, no question about it, the Pharaoh was going to resurrect. He's a god. He's related to the gods. But... The only shot you had at it maybe as a commoner is if you were maybe a member of the court and were associated with the pharaoh, and he would give you a really great sort of bonus. He would let you be buried near his pyramid. 
then maybe you'd be resurrected, you know? Um, but eventually that became sort of more democratized. Everybody thought, thought they could be immortal. And I think maybe these pharaohs of the later dynasties who are building their pyramids near Sneferu have a little bit of that. I'm building near Sneferu because he's going to resurrect for sure. He was a real god. Maybe I'll go with him. So it's sacred ground that they're building on. So there are a couple of small pyramids. Um, one king of the dynasty, Hor is his name, H-O-R. That's oh. the Egyptian word for Horus. You know, the Greeks had the, the U.S. ending at the end. So Hor means Horus. So he's saying he's Horus. Um, king Hor had a short reign, but a pyramid at, at Dashur. And what I love about his pyramid is they found a statue, really neat statue. It's life-size, made out of wood. Now, let me say this. Wood was expensive in Egypt. This is a sign that they're not completely downhill. A life-size statue out of wood was really something because most of the wood was imported. They didn't have really forest for timber. They had some acacia trees. They used acacia, things like that. And if you look at wooden statues in Egypt, you know, if you look at ancient Egyptian wooden statues, you'll see they're pegged together out of little pieces. Very often they'll take a little plug and put it in the shoulder. They'll take something else and put it here. They're using every little piece they can. But Hor has a life-size statue. Now, it's a Ka statue. Remember we talked about the Egyptians believed that there were different parts of the soul. And the Ka was kind of like your double. You know, sort of like your ethereal double. <laughs> and the hieroglyph for Ka, it's written in English, K-A, is two arms, uh, kind of upraised. The best I can tell you is, if I can tell you is, it looks just like in a football game when the referee says field goal and raises his arms up. It looks just like that. And the Ka statue of Hor, it, it's almost, you know, to us it looks almost comical. To make sure that his soul wouldn't make any mistake, that this is the statue for you, on the top of his head, are two large arms that look like he's saying field goal. You know, not his arms coming from his shoulders. They're just mounted on the top of the head saying, this is the Ka statue. But it's a wonderful work of art. It's kind of a holdover from the previous dynasty. When they can do good art, they knew what they were doing. There are also four small pyramids of this period at Saqqara, right? Again, at least they're building pyramids. Um, but let me say why I say there's a decline. The last 57 years of this dynasty... There's another dynasty, right? A 14th dynasty. They call themselves the 14th. They're ruling from the Delta. Right? Now, the Delta, right? let me describe the Delta. It's not too far away, so it's a sign that kingship is weakening. Remember, we have the, the capital was in the Fayum. And the reason the capital's in the Fayum is for military purposes. That's why those guys moved it to the Fayum. In case anybody invades from the north, you got, you're right at the top of, of Egypt almost. Uh, you can control it. But these people are ruling or calling themselves kings anyway in the Delta. Now, the Delta is called the Delta, if you're a member, because when the Greeks came into Egypt from the north, they came via the Mediterranean, and they saw this marshy land that was shaped like a triangle, which is the Greek letter Delta. So they called it the Delta. The Delta is very moist. It's very difficult to excavate in the Delta. When, you know, when Egyptology really started, it was really to prove the Bible. In the end of the 19th century, and in England, the first exploration society to explore Egypt was called the Delta Exploration Society. All right. So that was the... How can I say this? I'm at a loss for words, y'all. That was the first point that I wanted to make about this this section. He was talking about how this new group of uh, kings had their people to try and build pyramids. Okay, no biggie there. A lot of people have done it. But they didn't make them quite as good as the OG pyramid builders. Uh, why? Uh, not enough money, you know, budget's kind of tight. Work with what you got. But then he starts talking about the Israelites kind of mentions them 
And as I said earlier in earlier videos, there will be a lot of references to the Bible. This is no, <coughs> I bullshit you not. That's, that's, that, that's the only way I could stress what I'm talking about. The a lot of people, so-called professionals, would have regular folk believe that you know this happened one period in, in history, this happened fifty years later in history, this happened like three thousand years later in history, and some of this stuff happened within years of each other. Slavery in America was happening at the same time when these so-called uh, adventurers were going over to America, going over, excuse me, going over to Egypt from America, from France, from Germany, from England. It was a lot of people representing And there's nothing wrong with going to see the sights and marvel at at the 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 wonders, but do you have to take everything that's not nailed down? Not not only did they steal, not only did they take material things, but they stole a whole people's history they they stole our black folks history it didn't our history negro history did not just start in america you know america is is a melting pot what makes america great is the fact that you got immigrants from all over the world coming together, bringing their resources, their talents, their skills, and building something together. And that was the same thing with Egypt. Egypt was, was a combination of people from all over Africa, from different tribes, coming, to, coming together together through trade and making something great. Some of the things we've been told did wrong, never happened. And if it did happen, it didn't happen the way it was told to us. It's not until people like Professor Breyer have taken an interest in what happened over there. They're trying to research, trying to document this stuff because they really want to know what made Egypt so great. Why did they fail? Why did they live in the society that they did? So them answering those questions indirectly gives us a history of of the black nation, of the black people. So, yeah, this is very interesting. And I'm going to continue to the end of the end of the series. And after that, we'll pick up another series. But we, we still got a long ways to go. A long ways to go. And with that being said, let's continue. When, you know, it's such a hard excavation, the reason is they thought the Israelites went out that way, right? If they got out of Egypt, they went through the Delta, and everybody was looking for proof of the Bible. So it was first the Delta Exploration Society. Soon after, they changed their name to the Egypt Exploration Society, broadened their approach, and that's what it is today. In England today, you still have the Egypt Exploration Society. Now, the Delta, as I say, is a very difficult place to excavate because it's moist. Now. The best description I can give you to imagine is the Nile, as you know, flows from south to north. At Khartoum, two rivers join, the Blue Nile and the White Nile, forming our Nile. Going north, 
But as it gets towards the Mediterranean, the Nile branches out. And if you imagine a hand going towards the Mediterranean with the fingers towards the tongue, the wrist and the arm is the Nile. But then you get several branches, half dozen branches of the Nile going to the Mediterranean. And that's going to give you a lot of moisture in the delta. That is the delta. The delta is the hand part of my metaphor. And you've got different branches of the Nile. So you've got water everywhere. And when these guys from the Delta Exploration Fund started excavating, they had a lot of trouble with water. And it's still hard. And what that means for us is that we don't have many records for the Delta because everything sunk down. So he's continuing on. We're talking about the period of, uh, I believe you said the 13th, 14th dynasty, somewhere around that area. And he's saying that a lot of the, the, the area is water damaged. It's a delta. It's, it's just, that's just what it is. And what I did not know, what I did not know was that the Greeks named the Delta the Delta. And and that's, it's sad, but it is what it is. It's sad. I say it's sad because you want to know the original name of what the Egyptians called everything. But a lot of times that information is lost. So all we have is Greek and Roman. So do you go with the Greek? Do you go with the Roman? I guess it's, it's up to the individual. You, you choose whatever name, whatever period, of, whatever dynasty that you, uh, can relate to you know your information is based off of that so but yeah it's about to get real interesting y'all don't leave got some more information for you when you have two groups claiming to be the pharaohs there are problems now you've got this 13th and 14th dynasty the ends are sort of going at the same time then we've got the 15th dynasty this is going to be our second phase. Remember, we have three phases. Egypt is weakening. That's dynasty 13 with dynasty 14. But now we're going to get Egypt under foreigners, dynasty 15. These people are called the Hyksos. Now, Hyksos is a word made up of two Egyptian words, and it's mistranslated often in the past. Now we've got it pretty much right. Almost everybody agrees. But it used to be said that these people were shepherd kings. Now, I think the idea was that they were nomadic wanderers who came into Egypt and somehow took over. But now we know the translation that's really correct is foreign kings. Foreign kings. See, one of the difficulties about figuring out who these people really were is that the Egyptians had a very special sense of history. They never kept records of the bad days. In other words, if you read battle accounts of ancient Egyptian wars, they never lost a battle. You know, you'll get accounts of pharaohs who won every single battle. They just kept winning them closer to home, you know, as they retreated. Uh, so the Egyptians didn't have a sense of history like we do that you have to be accurate, you have to keep it all right. So we don't have a lot of records of these people. But in general, we call them the foreign kings, the Hyksos. Now, we're pretty sure that they're Semites coming from what might be Palestine area, Canaan, somewhere around there. They may not have even just conquered. They may not have just came in and conquered. It could be they lived in Egypt for quite a while and then sort of somehow just took over. The reason I say that is, remember last time we talked about the tombs of Beni Hassan? Those were the tombs where the nomarchs were that were kind of very grand during the 12th dynasty, during the Middle Kingdom. Well, the tombs of Beni Hassan show Semites in Egypt. We can tell they're Semites. They have little beards. They wear different clothes. They have kind of colored cloth like a kaftan with lots of you know fancy designs uh, they're bringing tribute they're bringing trade goods things like that so there's no question about it 
Semites were living in Egypt before this period. So there may have been a lot of Semites there and then just take over. Or perhaps they really come in and conquer. We don't know for sure. But anyway, we do know that these Hyksos set up shop in the delta in the north. And they establish a capital called Avarice. Now, again, remember, it's moist in the delta. We don't have very much in the way of artifacts from these people. They really are a mystery. There's an excavation going right on. Right? It's, it's, they're doing it. They're, they're plowing right on. But they're not finding as much as they'd like. Manfred Bitok is doing it right now. It's at Tel Adaba, which is the modern name of where Avarice was. He's from the University of Vienna. But it's a he hard excavation. The water table's fairly high. But he's found some interesting things. Uh, let me tell you what he has found. One is that these Hyksos were somehow interacting with other foreigners. One of the big surprises of Betok's excavation is that he found frescoes, paintings from walls at Avarice, the Hyksos capital, damaged, but big enough fragments, say, bigger than your fist, bigger than your hand, that show that they had paintings from, like Minoan artists had done them, from Crete. So these are certainly, they probably had Cretan artists maybe who were doing them, or they'd seen these, but there's this exchange somehow of Minoan art with the Hyksos. Very curious. The Egyptians never had this. So they're doing, you know, foreign things. There's even a jar with a Hyksos cartouche, you know, the, the oval, found at Knossos on Crete in the palace. So maybe the Hyksos sent some sort of presence there. They got artists back. But the Hyksos are not just staying put in the delta. Now, they worship strange gods, these hips, Hyksos. I mean, really strange. <laughs> One is Seth. Now, remember from our mythology lecture that Seth was the evil god? He's the one who hacked Osiris into 13 pieces and then tries to, you know, really destroy him. These guys worship Seth. Now, in some sense, it sounds like they were devil worshippers. In some sense. It's not quite right. Because, believe it or not, there were some Egyptians who were mainstream establishment who worshipped Seth. We don't really understand how you can do this. But what may be the case is that sometime in a later period, Seth becomes a good guy. You know, well, there's Seth. Of the, oh, there's that Seth who killed Osiris. No, no, that's not that Seth. It's this Seth. But there's this strange thing about worshipping this, this, what seems to be the bad god. Now, Seth was represented by an animal. And the animal is called the Seth animal because it's like, like no animal we've ever seen. Has the head, it looks a little bit like a, a goat almost, with kind of ram-shaped horns going back. And then it has a tail, it has a body more like a feline or canine, and it has a tail that's forked at the end that goes up into the air. Right? Like a, almost like an animal that's decided by committee. Um, it's interesting that this evil one has a forked tail, you know, a kind of devil always has. But um, that's the animal that usually represents Seth. Very strange that he was so prominent in Egyptian mythology and worshipped by these Hyksos. They also brought in their own god. They have a god, Reshep, who was a god of storms, right? Kind of interesting. Also war, right? War and storm. What I wonder about the Hyksos, because they were these foreign people, um, did they have temples like the Egyptians? You know, Egyptian temples were a big deal. They were you know, large affairs with lots of priests bustling around. Did the Hyksos have them? If they did, the temples are gone. But they don't really seem to have integrated. One of the things about the Hyksos that I think is, is important is they were illiterate. They mm -hmm. seem to be illiterate. At least we don't have carvings on walls that they've left. And the reason I'm pretty sure they were close to illiterate is they carved scarabs, you know, those little beetles that were carved out of stone to be amulets. And often, if you were an Egyptian and carved a scarab, you would do it with your name on the bottom and, and maybe a, a, a sort of a magical prayer. You know, you'd say, even, there were scarabs that say Happy New Year, for example, you know, or good health to you. The scarabs that these Hyksos carved are just kind of mainly scroll work designs, you know, geometrics, not like they were into the language at all. And scarabs are important to us because, you know, scarabs travel easily. They're small. They're trade objects. You can give one away. Somebody takes it. He takes it home with him. Doesn't have to pack it. Scarabs travel like beads. You know, ask any archaeologist. Beads get around. You know, you find beads from this civilization and another civilization. You don't find many Hyksos scarabs in the south. It looks like they stayed put in the delta. They may have gone north to Crete. You know, they may have done something. 
but they didn't go south. You don't find hexoscarabs. So anyway, these were a strange crew. Um, some people think, and it's just a, just a possibility, some people think that the hexos are really Joseph and his brothers. Remember in the Bible, the Israelites go into Egypt, Joseph goes into Egypt, and eventually his brothers go into Egypt? Some people think that the hexos may have been Joseph, but we'll talk about that later. Well, uh, yeah, again with the uh, with the Bible reference, Joseph. I didn't notice. I had not thought about that until I started hearing things on the internet, watching episodes on History Channel. That there's a possibility that Joseph's family were the Hyksos. I, I can't say for certain, but the the it's a possibility. The professor's gonna dig deeper into that as we continue. Um this is a long one, so I'm probably gonna just do a part two and a part three. Definitely a part two. Maybe a part three. We'll see. But on that note, I will chat with you all later.